All right, so this week we take up the issue of poverty. That is, uh, we'll look at uh, explanations for poverty, and then on a more technical level, we'll think about different ways in which we've uh, defined and we've uh, and the ways that we've also measured poverty over the years. So uh, let me just uh, dive right into the outline for this week. We'll start out with uh, the basic theories that are out there. Uh, there are certainly more than four explanations for why people are poor, but uh, we'll try to uh, make sense of all those explanations and condense them down to four uh, major theories of poverty. And then in the second part of this lecture, we'll take a look at, uh, on a more technical level, we'll look at definitions, that is operational definitions of poverty, and also uh, take a look at the official uh, U.S. Census method of measuring poverty. Uh, and uh, using that method of measurement, we'll take a look at who's actually poor in the U.S., uh, distinguishing between poverty rates and poverty composition, two different ways in which you might interpret the poverty statistics that are released by the Census Bureau. Uh, and then uh, taking those rates, we'll compare across time and across different national context to give us a better idea about what those poverty rates uh, actually tell us about the extent of uh, poverty in the U.S. And then in the last part of this lecture, uh, we'll take up uh, sort of a larger uh, policy issue. That is uh, not just with respect to poverty, but uh, some of the side issues that come up. And namely, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the work effort, right? We've noted this, uh, this conundrum between uh, poverty, uh, namely uh, the lack of security and work. Right? That is, there might be a trade-off between the two. And so we take a look at a historical example of a tool that's been used by the government in the way of addressing uh, both poverty and the work effort simultaneously. And that's in the way of the earnings disregard. All right, so first, before we uh, dive in into a more technical discussion, I just want to lay out very briefly uh, some of the major explanations or theories for poverty. Uh, and so, but before I do, let me just make a quick point that uh, certainly when we talk about poverty, uh, there's uh, lots of different ways to conceive of poverty. Just like when we think about diversity, our topic from last week, uh, there are so many different dimensions of diversity, certainly. We think about race and gender and sexual orientation, and just uh, the list goes on and on. In the same way, uh, poverty can be conceptualized in lots of different ways. Uh, and so uh, it's somewhat of a disservice to think about poverty just one dimensionally, but uh, we sacrifice uh, in the way of breadth for a little more depth and so my point here is that we're taking an economic view of poverty uh, in this entire uh, lecture. Okay? It's one particular view of poverty. You might think about social poverty or relational poverty, but uh, we're going to take an economic view of poverty. Okay? Uh, and so uh, let me just lay out, uh, without uh, any slides, just uh, the four major explanations uh, or four classes of, of explanations for why people are poor. Uh, and so typically the explanations will center on, on either individual level factors or structural level factors, uh, we can make that uh, uh, distinction first. Uh, and so looking in the way of individual level uh, explanations, uh, one particular line of explanations will say that people are poor because of uh, genetic differences, or more bluntly stated, genetic inferiority. Right? Uh, and there's some more extreme versions of this argument uh, basically equating, uh, equating genetic differences uh, in the population with racial differences in the population in turn uh, income levels or economic levels, and so basically stating that uh, race might be related uh, to economic standing. And so uh, as scholars, as social science scholars, we don't uh, typically lay much importance on these types of explanations, but uh, I just want to note that uh, the surveys that ask people's opinions about the different reasons for poverty, uh, there's still some popular support, the notion that, uh, that poverty may actually be due to uh, genetic differences between people. All right, so that's the first set of explanations that we consider, these genetic explanations. Uh, the second line of explanations is still centered on individual level factors, but not attributing uh, poverty to individual, to genetic differences per se, but now we're looking at uh, cultural explanations, uh, namely that uh, the poor are poor because uh, they don't possess the right values, the right belief systems to actually succeed in our society. So uh, more specifically uh, and more bluntly, that people are poor because they don't work hard enough uh, that they don't uh, know how to delay gratification. Right? Putting off the purchase of that stereo, you wouldn't be poor if you, uh, if you, uh, if you just uh, held off on that purchase. Right? Uh, that the people are poor because of low self-esteem and such. So uh, you get the idea. Uh, so this is attributing poverty to values and beliefs that might be inherent in, in certain cultures, namely that there's a, uh, a culture within the poor. Right? Uh, and so these are commonalities common values, common belief systems that are held between people who are poor. Uh, I just had a, a student point out this week that uh, if we're talking culture, that there might be other aspects of culture that are involved. So let's say uh, language, the student pointed out, 
right? Uh, it could be that uh, among some poor, that language may inhibit uh, uh, one, that's one aspect of culture that might inhibit uh, the poor from uh, succeeding in life, okay? And so uh, the second set of explanations that we're laying out here, and so if we're shifting gears, we go to more structural explanations, and the third set of explanations were attributing poverty to uh, institutions or societal structures that are ingrained in our culture, in our, uh, in our country, uh, that impede people from realizing their full potential. So things like economic structures or economic institutions, right? The capitalist system, uh, we'll get into a more uh, a detailed discussion in the fourth set of explanations, but that uh, there are certain economic structures that inhibit people uh, from getting ahead in life. And so the, uh, the primary example here is looking historically at relocation of jobs. If jobs are in fact relocating outside of cities or uh, maybe to a different country altogether, it's not necessarily the fault of the individual, uh, that's uh, that's to be pointed out in the way of why people are poor. That it's uh, it's just a structural level factor, right? In the same way that you might say that people are poor because of our government policies. It might be due to the government itself uh, and the government's generosity in the way of providing for the poor that actually generates poverty or maintains poverty, uh, or the educational system, right? You might point out that uh, schools that don't have the right resources uh, don't provide the right opportunities for people. Uh, to uh, succeed in life. And so these are structural level factors. And then finally, uh, looking a little more at uh, the economics, uh, the fourth and final explanation would say that people are poor because it's just inherent uh, in our capitalist system. This is a Marxist explanation. Uh, if you've ever had a sociology course and you've talked about Marx, you've, uh, you've considered uh, the notion that there is a class structure, right? Marx predicted that in a capitalist society, that you would eventually end up with two major classes of person. That is, you'd have the upper and the lower class. Uh, and so the upper class, more technically speaking, you'd have the bourgeois and the proletariat, and that there would be class struggle. Namely, the bourgeois would, uh, would uh, exploit the lower classes, the proletariat, to their advantage. And so there are actually people, there are actually actors in a capitalist system that actually benefit from the existence of poverty, is the, the explanation here. And so this is looking at class struggle, class differences, and class exploitation, essentially, as a major uh, driver of why we, why we have uh, poverty today. And so uh, those are the four major, major explanations that we'll consider for purposes of this class. And so in the second part of this lecture, we'll uh, dive in uh, to defining and measuring poverty on a more technical level.